Hi everybody, welcome back to Between the Lines. My name's Julian, I'm an obsessive reader and used book collector, and I finished the third book in The Wheel of Time. So I've now read three books in The Wheel of Time, I'm on my first read, I'm totally new to the series, and today I'm gonna be talking my thoughts on book three. And to just give you a general idea of what I thought about it, it was a bit more mixed on this one than I was for the first two. This one was a lot more frustrating and a little bit more uneven, but there was still plenty that I really liked and a lot to talk about, so let's get into it. So like all my reviews for The Wheel of Time so far, it's gonna be spoiler free, and then I'll get into a spoilers section later on, but I'll put a tag up on screen so that if you haven't read this book yet and just want my general spoiler free thoughts, you can just skip past that and go to the wrap up of the video. But be warned, if you are gonna stick around for the spoiler free section, I will be talking spoilers for the first two books, The Eye of the World and The Great Hunt. So The Dragon Reborn follows up a bit after the events of The Great Hunt. Rand has woken up from his fight with Baelzamon on and is slowly leaning in more into that role as the Dragon Reborn, although he's not completely convinced that he still is it, despite a lot of people telling him that he is. And he's been in camp throughout the winter with Moraine and Lan and Perrin and a lot of the soldiers from Shinar that he was traveling with at Falma. And while they're waiting out the winter, the other group of our heroes, Matt, Egwene, Nynaeve, and Elaine, are going back to the White Tower to resume their training for the girls and for Matt hopefully be healed from his little relationship he's got with the dagger. So here are my thoughts about The Dragon Reborn. Like I said, I was a bit more mixed on this one. This book was a little frustrating, but let's start off with the positives. There's still a lot I really enjoyed about this book, so let's kick it off with those. Something I really appreciated about this book, especially compared to book two, was that it felt the character development was more generously dispersed among our main cast. Book two was very Rand focused, and this one gave a lot, especially more to our side characters, even more so than Rand. I liked spending time with these characters, getting to know them a bit more, and of course seeing them grow. One of the reasons that I actually took away from this book for me was that we maybe spent too much time with some characters that weren't that interesting, but I did really enjoy spending time with our Emmons fielders and just getting to know them more. And there's a couple really awesome scenes with them. There's especially one in particular with Perrin that I just absolutely loved this scene and it's been something I've been looking for since book one with Perrin. I was just waiting for something like this to happen and when I finally got to this very mellow and not the most exciting or high stakes scene but I just had such a great time with it. It was so beautiful and it just made me appreciate Perrin a lot more. And in this book we spend way more time with Matt than we have in the first two and getting to learn a lot more about him and kind of where his character is going to start going from here and how he's going to be different from how he was in the first two books and he's so much fun and to see what he was going through in this book and the encounters he had and learning about more of his skills and how those are gonna develop was so much fun and I really, really appreciated spending that time with him. And of course, seeing Egwene and Nynaeve really build on their skills in learning in the White Tower and seeing how their powers are evolving and how much stronger they're getting, and especially Egwene's growth after her time in imprisonment with the Shan Chan and how she has reacted to that in the time since and how she uses that sometimes to fuel her own anger and resentment is something that I was really interested to see and I thought was handled very well. And of course a highlight like it has been in the first two books, learning about all the cultures of this world has been such a treat. I absolutely love learning about the cultures in this world that Robert Jordan has created. They're so fleshed out and unique and they never feel the same as another. And especially there's one culture in here, I won't say who it is, but they have such unique customs and traditions and the kind of blends of inspiration they are of real world cultures is so cool. If you've read the book, you probably know which culture I'm talking about and I'm pretty sure we're gonna see a lot more of them and I absolutely can't wait. And just like the first two books as well, probably the biggest strength of Robert Jordan's world building is the locations. They're all so well crafted and fleshed out and easily identifiable. They were even again, like I've said in the first two reviews, 
two cities or two towns that maybe are even very close to each other geographically, but feel so distinct and identifiable right from the first page that they're brought up. Even if they share some little cultural things or geographical things together, they still feel like they have their own identity and that's something I appreciate so much in Robert Jordan's writing. But let's get into the spoiler-free things that I didn't necessarily like or didn't work for me as well as some of the other points in the book. I think this one out of the three that I've read had the most uneven pacing. I think that The Eye of the World had more even pacing throughout the whole book where it starts a bit slow but the action kicks in pretty quickly and then we're on a journey with them throughout the whole book. It maybe sagged a bit a little when the characters split up in The Eye of the World but besides that I thought it was fine. The Great Hunt had really fast pacing and that was one of the highlights of the book for me. But in this book we start off really strong. I really enjoyed how the book started off and the first perspective we have there and then it very quickly after that was all set up crawled to a stop and we spent a lot of time just from one or two perspectives in the same area and it really was a bit of a struggle for me to not get through it but i thought okay let's just get moving let's have things start to happen and i thought part of this as well was that a lot of the conflicts inter-character conflict or also internal conflict in individual characters has been very repetitive and there was a lot of wheel spinning with that. There are the same conflicts that a lot of characters were dealing with even in the first and second book that they're still dealing with grappling the exact same things in this one and it feels like what was the point of all that change and transformation they've gone through if they're struggling with the exact same thing. And I just know, okay, I'm gonna have to go through a whole book for them to maybe take two steps forward, one back. Sometimes that felt a little frustrating to me. And like I said before, with spending all that time with the characters, I really enjoyed hanging out with our Edmonds Fielders, but for a while there, it was getting a little slow. And that one section I mentioned where we were just with kind of one group for a couple hundred pages, I thought maybe could have benefited from some cross-cutting to other perspectives just to amp up the pace and get things moving a bit more. And I think that the thing that bothered me the most about this one, or at least frustrated me the most, was the lack of communication between characters. And I understand that this is a big point throughout the series for a lot of people. And it was something for me that I struggled with a bit in the Dark Tower series, but that was the point of the story that these people weren't communicating and that when they resolved that, things were able to actually move forward. But it feels very repetitive how in each book, things will be happening like the exact same thing to multiple characters and if they just talked about it or brought it up then I felt like I would have been more on the same page with them but it got a little frustrating and repetitive just the fact that they weren't telling each other what was going on. So that's it for my spoiler free thoughts of The Dragon Reborn. All in all I gotta say I had a good time with this book. I still really enjoyed hanging out with these characters, spending time with them, learning more about the world but the highs in this book just weren't as high as the ones in the first two books and the lows were a bit lower. All in all, even though I may have some issues with the book, it's still a good book. I still had a good time with it. I just really like spending time with these people, the characters we've been introduced to. Going into a Wheel of Time book is starting to feel more and more cozy and comfortable for me because I'm getting more familiar with the world and the characters. So returning to each entry in this series, even though I'm only at book three now, has been so welcoming and rewarding. So now we'll get into the spoilers. So be warned from this point on, there will be spoilers for book three, The Dragon Reborn. So if you haven't read the book, I would skip to the time I put on screen, but if you have or just don't care, then keep watching. So let's get into what I really appreciated about this book. The scene I was talking about earlier with Perrin was the blacksmithing chapter. It was just so beautifully written and I've been waiting for Perrin to do this since the beginning. I love anything to do with blacksmithing or swords, making swords. That's like my favorite fantasy thing out there and once I found out that Perrin was a blacksmith in book one I had just been waiting for him to do some actual blacksmithing and when we finally got to this I just love this chapter. I was listening to some great music that totally fit the scene and just watching Perrin do this kind of rote and monotonous thing was actually such a pleasant experience and I had a lot of fun with it. And also Matt. Matt is so awesome and so funny and especially seeing him now after he's been healed getting a bit more into who he really is that we really haven't seen since very early in the eye of the world was so refreshing and I thought it was really funny that as soon as he woke up, he was thinking, oh, Rand and Perrin are the ones that have lost their minds. I'm the only normal one while the dude's literally eating food meant for four people and just naked in this room after being healed from a murder knife. And his power kind of being luck or something to do with manipulating odds or something like that was 
really cool and a power I haven't seen too much of in fantasy books like this. I'm not the most well versed in modern fantasy so there might be other books that do something similar to this but I thought it was really different and really cool and identifiable enough from what Ren and Perrin are going through to really feel like it suits Matt and that it's its own thing and I'm really excited to see where it goes from there. And I also really liked seeing how Egwene and Nynaeve's power is growing and Egwene's earth powers which are awesome and a little scary and I need of course getting so much stronger throughout this book and all of the dream stuff I thought was really cool seeing how that's developing and I think that's really exciting and having Egwene's powers be very different from Nynaeve and of course how their personality shapes how they channel. And speaking of channeling seeing what Rand was up to in the little we got of him in this book was terrifying and awesome. I wished we saw more of Ran, but honestly, the stuff that we did see of him was very unsettling. Seeing how he's getting so much stronger at channeling and how he might be actually starting to go through the madness of being able to channel Sidene. Especially that scene when he just killed a dog, which might be a dark hound or not, I don't know. And then the scene when he beheads the merchant and kills all her companions and then arranges the body with channeling so that they're bowing in front of him, I thought was totally unsettling and unnerving but definitely awesome too and like i was saying about the cultures the aiel they're just the coolest they're so cool i cannot wait to see more of the aiel in the books going forward learning about their cultures and in the podcast i was listening to accompanying this the wheel weaves one of the hosts did a really great job of breaking down how the aiel system kind of works with the clans and seps and all that and seeing how that there's this scottish highland influence in how the clans and seps work meeting with tropes of people who live in the desert i think that's a really unique blend of cultures and they're just totally badass i mean like the maidens of the spear are totally the coolest people in these books and of course meeting some of the other characters who easily dispatch fades and all that was just pure awesome and of course the locations Ilian and Tyr especially are the ones that i was talking about before how they're very close together and are somewhat similar in geography and culture but are different enough that when the characters were there it never felt like it was pulling too much of the same stuff and finally getting to the stone of Tyr was something i've been looking forward to for the last few books being that one of the prophecies that were built up about the dragon and all that and seeing that play out here was really cool and now let's get into some of the spoilerish things that didn't really work for me. And the biggest thing that didn't work for me in this book was the antagonists. I think the Forsaken just suck. <laughs> I don't think they're very interesting or dangerous, threatening bad guys. I just think they're really incompetent and very silly. I mean, over the last three books, we got in the first book, the two Forsaken who just kind of show up at the end and are easily dispatched in like two pages. Then in the second book, we got Lanfear pretending to be Selene and being literally the least sneaky person in the world. And in this book, we get the Forsaken who are controlling more of the political aspect and the monarchies of the world. And we get Belal, who's kind of like the big bad of this one or the one who's been pulling a lot of the strings. And then Moraine shows up and essentially just Kamehameha's him into oblivion. I mean, these are supposed to be the most dangerous people on the planet and Moraine, who is not nearly close to their power level as stated in the books, instantly just bail fires the shit out of this one guy. And of course, Lanfear shows up again and I like how she's leaning more into just being Lanfear and we're seeing kind of who she is as that and not trying to be not so sneaky Selene. And then back to the Shadow Spawn. These characters felt a lot more intimidating and dangerous and threatening to our main characters in the very early parts of book one and then somewhat in book two. But in this one, they go back to just kind of being disposable, silly minions. Even the fades, which in the first book, I thought were being built up to be kind Kind of the ring wraith figures and it's supposed to be very scary and they are scary but the way they're handled is not very scary and this is something that's been a recurring theme throughout the books that has kind of bothered me a little there's no way to set up these high stakes and these dangerous bad guys if our heroes are always winning against them i don't know how many times we've seen a fade take someone down versus how many times a good guy takes down a fade they just seem like they're not that scary at this point and even the soulless who I don't think managed to even fulfill one of their tasks in this book and the Dark Hounds, which are instantly obliterated. Trollocs don't feel dangerous anymore. And I get that's part of the point of progressing the characters and showing how they're growing and becoming stronger and more capable. But at the same time, when these characters show up, these antagonists, I don't feel any danger for our main cast. There was one exception in this book where the characters 
kind of get their ass handed to them. And that's when the girls get kidnapped by the Black Aja, which was the one instance when the antagonist felt dangerous and I thought it was really effective. And of course that sets up the whole final act for those characters. So it all worked out. And of course, the one time that the bad guys win, it really ramped up the stakes for me. And to speak again to sort of the repetitive conflicts and wheel spinning that I've seen in these books, we get a Rand and Baelzamon showdown at the end where Baelzamon loses for the third time. Baelzamon is just as incompetent as the Forsaken are. And he just kind of like shows up and loses every time. Like he feels like Team Rocket to me. And now in this case, we get Rand beating him again. Although I thought it was pretty funny that as soon as Rand picked up the sword, he turned to Baelzamon and was like, it's my turn, mother Baelzamon just booked it and ran, ran after him. And of course, considering how kind of off kilter Rand has been lately to picture him just kind of sprinting after Baelzamon was a little funny. And then of course, Rand defeats him. And for the third time, he thinks he killed the Dark One. And it's like, ugh, how many times do we have to go through this? And just like Rand, I was missing Moraine and Lan's presence in this book. Although there was plenty more of them than there was in The Great Hunt where they were barely in it, I feel like we haven't really spent enough time with these characters since book one. So I've been missing them. I really like them as characters. I think they're really intriguing. Maureen's a little frustrating in that she doesn't explain things, but that's her whole I said I thing that they do. I really like Lan. Lan might be my favorite character in the series so far, and I just really want to read parts with this dude in it because he is so cool and I want to see how he's going to develop. All right, so that's it for my review of The Dragon Reborn. I know it felt kind of ranty and I was a bit more mixed and negative on this one, but overall, I still had a great time with this book. Despite this one being frustrating, I'm very much looking forward to reading the next book in the series, The Shadow Rising. I've heard that this one is excellent and a lot of people consider it the best in the series. I'll still need some time before I get into it. When I'm reading a big series, I like to take a little bit of a break in between reading entries, especially considering that I found out that the next book is the longest in the series, I believe, and significantly longer than book three. So I didn't want to get into it right away and just burn out. So in the comments, let me know what you thought of book three. If you're a veteran of the series, is this one of your favorite? favorite or least favorite ones are somewhere in the middle. And if you're new to this book, just like me, how do you feel it compared to books one and two? So before you go, remember to do all the YouTube stuff like liking and subscribing. It always helps out. And as always, thank you for watching. Please remember to support your local library and I'll see you next time.